okay, so it's supposed to happen the fourth. It's not going to happen the fourth. Well, okay, the fifth. Okay, but but wait, wait, wait. Today's the third. Yeah, but but they don't they need four straight days of good weather because it's the weather's getting bad. They're, yeah, that's what the G- Germans believe, right? They need so they so they, so okay. So they're gonna attack when the Germans don't think they can attack. But if it's bad weather, then they can't attack. Yeah, wow. So maybe so not the fifth. Okay, maybe the six, I guess. What? Well, they can't do the seventh, or it might be the twentieth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good luck. Yeah. Tell Dwight. Yeah. Okay. All right. June third, nineteen forty-four. You've made great advances all this spring, hitting enemy island bases and airfields one after another. You've relied on your intelligence branch to inform you of the best places and times to attack, and that has worked out great. But now, you rely on your own staff intelligence instead because it tells you what you want to hear. And the result is a bloody stalemate. You are Douglas MacArthur. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Allies broke out of their beachhead at Anzio and managed to link up with the bulk of their forces advancing towards Rome from the south. Things looked ever more grim for the Japanese at Impal and Kohima in India. The Americans made landings on Biak Island, where the Japanese have a major airbase. And in China, the Japanese captured Luoyang and ended phase one of their Ichigo offensive. The fighting in Hunan, phase two, began at the end of last week. Okay. I gotta talk about some politicking. The Chinese Military Affairs Commission is split on how they are going to defend or counterattack against the Japanese. One group thinks the Guangzhou Wuhan Railway is doomed to fail, so there's no point defending it, and they should pull back and defend the Hunan Guangxi Railway and fight and win a decisive battle at the Hunan Guangxi border. Xu Yongchang, the Minister of Military Operations, and some others, however, think this is a terrible idea. On May 28th, Xu meets the Military Affairs Commission. They argue their positions, with Xu angrily denouncing a pullback from the Guangzhou Wuhan Railway. He's pretty sure the Japanese forces being used for Ichigo are more about quantity than quality, and he also wants a counteroffensive in the north, contending that just retreating again and again would be terrible for morale. The easy defeats of Jiang Dingwen and Tang Enbo the past few weeks have aroused international comment. And Chiang Kai-shek agrees with Xu that what would be the prospect of the Sino-Japanese War should they abandon the Guangzhou-Wuhan Railway without a fight? The majority contends that withdrawing to the Hunan-Guangxi Railway would give them a whole month of time to prepare to defend Guilin near the Hunan-Guangxi border. It's like 650 kilometers from Hubei to Guilin, and getting the Japanese strung out along that trek would destroy their momentum, right? Well, on the 3rd of June, Xu wrote that a majority of the Military Affairs Commission believed that the Japanese intended to open up a rail connection to Zhenangguan, a pass on the Chinese-Vietnamese border. Xu disagreed and argues the Japanese would move against the U.S. air bases in South China only after the defense of the Guangzhou-Wuhan Railway. He was convinced the Japanese would attack the Chinese field armies to ward off a counteroffensive. Further, he held that the pace of Ichigo would be determined by the strength of the Nationalist Army's defense. Xu Yongchang underestimated Japanese intentions and capabilities, believing that they had insufficient strength to operate on three fronts simultaneously. Thing is, for the Japanese to secure those railways, they'll have to take Changsha, Hengyang, and Guilin. The first two are in China's ninth war zone under Shui Yue, and the last in the fourth war zone under Zhang Fakui. The Japanese army considered that the key to winning Operation Ichigo was to conquer Changsha, and it decided to deploy greater strength than during the previous three attempts. The defeat of Chinese offensives from the flanks at Hengyang and Changsha would be critical. The army also believed it would encounter the strongest resistance at Hengyang. As last week ended, five Japanese divisions began marching south along the Shang River. 
On the 28th, the Military Affairs Commission orders Shui Yue to prepare for battle between Changsha and Liu Yang. He asks for reinforcements from other war zones, but gets just one division from the 6th. His plan is to fight a controlled withdrawal along the river to degrade Japanese strength as much as possible before they reach Changsha and then encircle them near the city. But you know, this is what he did in the earlier battles for the city. So the Japanese are ready for it this time. They're advancing on a broad front with their main strength out on the flanks. So the flanks are gonna be tough to attack. We'll see what happens in a week or two when the Japanese arrive on the scene in force. In India, however, things are not going so well for the Japanese. Nobuo Tanaka, commanding the Japanese 33rd Division, fighting to try and take Impa, may finally be appreciating the words of Motoso Yanagida, from whom he took command a few weeks ago. It's all hopeless. Meaning that Renya Mutaguchi's entire Impal operation has been a waste of time and men. Tanaka has lost over half his force, and the remainder of his men are literally starving and are outnumbered and outgunned. He was now prepared to give tacit agreement to the proposition that Mutaguchi's orders to take Bishanpur at all costs simply meant massive casualties for Japan. But unless he was prepared to resign, he had no choice but to obey Mutaguchi's suicidal orders. On the 2nd of June, he therefore issued a general order, exhorting his troops to make one last effort to break through to Impal. This is what the order says. Now is the time to capture Impal. Our death-defying infantry group expects certain victory when it penetrates the main fortress of the enemy. The coming battle is the turning point. It will denote the success or failure of the Greater East Asia War. Regarding death as something light as a feather, you must tackle the task of capturing Impal. For that reason, it must be expected that the division will be almost annihilated. I have confidence in your firm courage and devotion and believe you will do your duty. On this battle rests the fate of the Empire. All officers and men fight courageously. The War of Attrition for that is all that it is, continues. There is a change in the situation up at Kohima, though. After losing the high ground in Naga village, Kotoku Sato pulls his troops out of Naga June 2nd, which gives a new advantage to the British. See, Montague Stopford has his men try and take Aradura Ridge in the southern sector the first half of the week, but this fails with heavy casualties. Taking Naga village, however, means his men can approach also from the north and they take Big Tree Hill, two kilometers northeast of Aradura. So as the week ends, the Japanese positions have been unhinged. Just over in Burma, Mad Mike Calvert is leading his Chindit Brigade towards Mogaung to try and take it from the Japanese as soon as possible. But they meet way heavier resistance than expected from the get-go, getting pushed back at Mogaung Bridge with heavy losses and only advancing after calling in airstrikes. In fact, Indian Viceroy Archie Wavell's son, also called Archie, is wounded and is not immediately flown out. So Chindit Commander Walter Lentain threatens to dismiss Calvert. But Calvert had more pressing problems than another row with Lentain. His own men in 77 Brigade were suffering grievously in the chaos of the monsoon. Men soaked and shivering slithered through mud. Packs doubled their weight in the wet. The rain made jungle tracks impassable. The monsoon had a multiplier effect on diseases, especially malaria and dysentery, but the Chindits found the worst enemy was scrub typhus, which killed large numbers of both Special Force and the West African Brigade. Calvert has said he can take Mogang by the 5th, but it is apparent that that is not going to happen. That's not the only place the Allies can't take nearly as quickly as they thought. See, on the 28th, the Americans begin to try to expand their perimeter on Biak Island, but a heavy Japanese counterattack near Mokmer causes heavy casualties and also causes them to pull back. Still, Southwest Pacific Area Commander Douglas MacArthur announces anyway that strategically the New Guinea campaign is over, even though there is still hard fighting to come. On the 29th, at both Arare and Biak Islands, the American beachheads are under threat. At Biak, Japanese tanks drive the 162nd Regiment almost back to their landing ground. On June 1st, the Americans begin advancing again, but this is not at all how the fight here was supposed to go. Okay. 
The spectacular pace and brilliant execution of MacArthur's spring advance up the northern coast of New Guinea owed as much to the remarkable efficiency of the U.S. Army's ultra-intelligence as it did to his generalship. Accurate estimates of garrison strengths had enabled him to attack only the weakest points in the southern flank of Japan's defense perimeter. However, at Biak, Ultra has told him there are at least 7,000 of the enemy, but he chooses to believe his staff intel that there is fewer than 3,000. He is wrong, and there are over 10,000 actually, and there are caves in the jungle-covered mountains where the enemy can set up strong defenses. So it's pretty much a stalemate by the end of the week. Japanese Admiral Soemu Toyoda, who now commands the combined fleet after the death of Minaichi Koga, really wants to keep this island because the airfield here is important to maintaining aerial supremacy south of the Palaus, which is where he thinks the next major US attacks will hit. His overall plan, Operation A Go, is for bringing the US fleet in for a decisive engagement. It's a more aggressive version of Operation Z, but we saw a couple months ago that the Allies have captured the Operation Z plans, so they kinda know what he wants to do. This might all come to a head fairly soon. Fighting that has already come to a head, with the fall of Monte Cassino, the breaking of the Gustav Line, and the breakout from Anzio all over the past couple weeks, is still going on in Italy. On the 28th, the Canadians take Ciprano. The fighting everywhere in Italy this week, actually, is fierce and bloody, but the German 14th Panzer Corps and 51st Mountain Corps are still pulling back to the Caesar Line. The 29th, the Canadians start heading up Highway 6 from Ciprano to Frosinone. The 30th, British troops take Arce. That night, two regiments of the US 36th Division march all night and by day have occupied the high ground behind the Caesar Line, effectively breaking it. The 31st, the Canadians take Frosinone and units out of Anzio take Velletri, tearing a hole in the Caesar Line. On the 1st, US 2nd and 6th Corps are now driving for Rome, attacking through the Alban Hills towards Albano and Valmontone. German commander smiling Albert Kesselring orders a fighting withdrawal to the north of Rome. On the 2nd, the Allies advance along the whole front, and the Americans reach Highway 6 at Valmontone. Today, as the week comes to an end, the Germans declare Rome an open city, the Americans take Albano, and the Canadians take Anagni. It seems Rome is very soon to fall. Now, the Western Allies and the Commonwealth forces have been in constant action lately, but their ally, the USSR, has not. But the Soviets have been far from quiet. They've been secretly moving around men in the millions for Operation Bagration, an offensive against German Army Group Center to be launched later this month. Something that size is bound to be picked up on sooner or later though. And on May 30th, German 9th Army reports a Red Army buildup near Rogachev. This is not enough to divert German High Command's attention from further south. They believe an offensive will be launched against Army Group North Ukraine. And as we've seen, they sent it a lot of center's armor. Walter Model commands North Ukraine, and he plans to fight off this offensive with his shield and sword strategy, which we saw earlier in the year when he commanded Army Group North. Ground is to be temporarily seated so that reserves can be gathered for a lightning counterattack that will relieve other areas of the front. This is also a way of, in theory temporarily, pulling back without calling it a withdrawal or a retreat since Adolf Hitler does not allow those. Army Group Center does note changes in deployment in the enemy opposing 3rd Panzer, 4th and 9th Armies. But they don't really react to this at all. And it isn't just deployment. The Germans are by now aware that the Western Front has been replaced by 2nd and 3rd Belarusian Fronts, which you'd think might have set off a few alarm bells, but no. Army Group Center Commander Ernst Busch is more concerned with 2nd Army's long right flank. He also wants 56 Panzer Corps back once Model has finished with it. It was transferred a couple weeks ago, as we saw. But the Soviets plan to hit him, and hit him hard. The final directives for Operation Bagration go out on May 31st and set the strategic objectives. They are to liberate Belarusia, advance to the Vistula, and the border of East Prussia. There are four fronts to make the attack, and two of them each will be coordinated by Georgi Zhukov and Alexander Vasilevsky. Zhukov, the first and second Belarusian fronts, with 38 divisions and one tank and one mechanized corps, 
and Vasilevsky, the third Belarusian and the first Baltic fronts with 39 divisions and two tank corps. The idea is that in phase one, they'll knock out the Axis communications hubs, Vitebsk, Orsha, Mogilev, Bobruisk. Then the flank forces will advance on Minsk down the Orsha-Minsk road from the northeast and up the Bobruisk-Minsk road from the southeast. They also plan to send forces north past Minsk and around to Baranovici to block an escape route. Minsk, of course, is a major, major prize. And the attacks that converge on it are to sort of sweep in an arc. Half of 1st Baltic Front Sector actually faces Army Group North, but they are to go into action from Polotsk to Vitebsk, 3rd Belarusian from Vitebsk to south of Orsha, 2nd from there to north of Rogachev on both sides of Mogilev, and 1st from north of Rogachev to south of Kovo. The last is the longest sector, but it's only 1st Belarusian's right flank that is going to attack. I'll talk more about this over the coming weeks. The operation is currently scheduled to begin June 23rd, although attacks against the Finns, which I mentioned last week, are set to begin already next week. The Western Allies have wanted Joseph Stalin to launch Bagration the same time as their invasion of Normandy, which goes off in just a few days, but he will not launch it not only until after the Allies launch Operation Overlord, but only if Overlord is successful in gaining a foothold in France. He's been skeptical about their prospects of success and actually skeptical of whether they will actually launch the offensive and open a front in Western Europe against the Axis. As for those Axis forces that face his impending offensive, Army Group Center has 38 divisions in the front with two infantry and two in Panzer or Panzer Grenadier divisions in reserve. They also have five security divisions in the rear, along with three Hungarian divisions. One of their frontline divisions is Hungarian. In terms of manpower, it's the strongest army group, but also has the longest front, 785 kilometers. Army Group North Ukraine, just to the south of center, holds 350 kilometers of front and is 35 German and 10 Hungarian divisions. Eight of those are, however, panzer divisions at this point. That's a big thing. In fact, army groups North and South Ukraine right now have 18 panzer or panzer grenadier divisions and army group center has just the three. Of course, Germany is still under attack this week anyhow. On the 28th, American bombers raid German synthetic oil plants as they did earlier in the month. They also continue last week's campaign against the rail system in France hitting marshalling yards. This does disrupt the German rail capacity, but kills 3,000 French civilians in two days. Winston Churchill writes to Air Chief Marshal Tedder, who is also deputy commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are piling up an awful load of hatred. But the bombing is effective, at least in some ways. For example, that same day, they destroy the German wireless station near Bruges in occupied Belgium, which means it's going to be way harder for the Germans to notice the extra volume of Allied radio traffic as the cross-channel invasion comes closer. Also on the 2nd, Operation Frantic begins. This is going to continue for a while and is shuttle bombing runs from American bases in Britain and Italy that land at Soviet bases in Ukraine. Today, it's 130 B-17s with 70 Mustangs as escorts, taking off from Foggia, Italy, hitting the marshalling yard at Debrecen, Hungary, and then landing at Poltava, Mirgorod, or Piriatin. And this week comes to an end. A week of fighting on Biak Island, a new phase of fighting in China, an advance in Italy that seems certain to reach Rome, but above all, a week of much foreboding as enormous offensives are soon to begin in both Western and Eastern Europe. I didn't talk about the invasion of Normandy today, did I? Which might seem odd since it's supposed to go off next week. Or is it? On June 1st, with the Normandy landing set for tomorrow, the 4th, on the 2nd they'll be moved to the 5th, but on the 1st, Schaeff, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Forces, sees the decrypt of a telegram from Japan's ambassador to Berlin, Count Oshima, to Tokyo, that reports on a conversation Oshima had with Adolf Hitler several days earlier. Hitler told Oshima the Allies had completed their preparation. They had assembled 80 divisions, eight of which had combat experience and were very good troops. That after diversionary operations in Norway, Denmark, Southwest France, and the French Mediterranean coast, they would establish a bridgehead in Normandy or Brittany, and that after seeing how things went, they would embark on establishing a real second front 
in the Dover Strait. So the Germans do think that either Normandy or Brittany is going to be hit, but they don't know when, and they don't think it's the main blow. But by today, well, well, when are those landings going to happen? If you ask German commander and France Gerd von Rundstedt, he'd tell you that wherever they land, they'll need four straight days of good weather. But that's not on the cards right now, so not next week. Well, okay, he wouldn't tell you, he would tell Berlin. Well, funny thing, he did tell Berlin and by top secret radio code, which is a code the Allies have broken, which leads Dwight Eisenhower, Schaefe himself, to deduce that if he can attack, when the enemy thinks it's not possible, attack even if it's very difficult, he will very much achieve surprise. But today on the 3rd, the weather begins to deteriorate, and Eisenhower knows that whatever he wishes, the 5th is just not possible anymore for D-Day to go off. Perhaps the whole thing will have to be postponed for weeks. We'll know more next week. Well, in just a few days to be precise, because our channel D-Day 24 Hours comes out on June 6th, whether or not the landings go off that day, and you will not want to miss that. A link is below and will likely pop up somewhere here soon enough. That channel and this channel and all our stuff is financed by the Time Ghost Army. You can join the army and be part of this at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. These are the newest commissioned officers, and the Time Ghost Army member of the week is Philippe Sandor Martin. And hey, if you want to see something we did that's a little bit off the wall, but super interesting, here's a Between Two Wars episode we call Frankenstein and the Socialist Origins of Electronic Music. Oh yes, indeed. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time. Mm -hmm.